hi everyone. I think we're just about ready to get started. Um, I hope everyone is doing well and OK. Um, on behalf of the Jobs AC team here um, today, I'd just like to welcome you all to our first virtual HE recruitment event. Um, slightly different format this year, but we've got three amazing speakers um, for you today who are here to share their wealth of knowledge on a number of very relevant topics, um, especially for this year as it's been very challenging. <laughs> um, the session will be approximately one hour long. Um, after each speaker, we've left some time for questions. Um, please use the live chat function on, um, on here throughout to submit any qu uh, questions or comments, and we'll do our best to answer um, as many as we can. Um, I think, I mean, unlike a face to face event. We've got no fire safety or anything else. So I think that's all the admin stuff for now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker. Um, Richard Billingham from Aston University will be discussing how the future of work is hybrid. Over to you, Richard. OK, thanks. Uh, th thanks very much, Brani. Um, yeah, so I've, um, I, I've I've titled this the, the future ain't what it used to be. Uh, and my starting point is going to be that whenever we move out of uh, the current restrictions into uh, into a future, it won't be returning to March 2020. It'll be returning to a new reality. And what we have to do is to create that new that new reality. In, in thinking about what I was going to present today, um, I've obviously been looking at at the news and following the press and and following a lot of comment about actually what will the future hold in terms of in terms of the office. Um, last Friday, Boris Johnson got up in the House of Commons uh, and and in usual Bojo style uh, positively affirmed that the office was not dead, that people will be willingly returning to offices in the near future and indeed actually that remote working will not be the new normal, uh, that people will happily go back into city centres and get their sandwiches from Pret-a-Manger and we will continue like nothing happened over the last 12 months. That is not my understanding of the future and however positive he might be about that future, I'm positive about a different future and that future I believe is going to be hybrid. I believe it'll be hybrid for a lot of different types of organisation, but I absolutely believe it'll be hybrid for universities. What we see an awful lot in the press is polarisation of the debate as if it's either the office or it's remote working. And I do firmly believe that actually it's, it's not a question of either or, it's and both. What I'm going to talk you through in the next 10 minutes uh, I suppose is my approach uh, with Aston, the things that we've been doing at Aston as we're dipping our toe into that future uh, and just reflect on some of my experiences. So I have a bit of form here, I will admit. Prior to coming to HE, I worked in local government and down at Bristol in Bristol City Council, we implemented a workplace programme which rationalised all of our central administrative buildings from 38 buildings down to two central administrative buildings and we created a, a, a really modern working environment which is one part of the picture. However, what we didn't have there was the experience of the last 12 months, uh, the experience of using um, using technologies such as Teams that we've all become so very used to doing. What I'm also seeing in um, in a lot of online chats in the HR communities between universities is people thinking about the future and wondering actually how on earth do I cut into this circle? Where do we start with this? In particular, I suppose um, I'm coming across two things. One is um, the debate about, well, how many days a week should people be in the office? What, what, what are the rules that universities are going to set or different workplaces are going to set about how many our expectations about how many days a week should people be in the office? The second is people asking about, well, has anyone developed a, um, a home working policy? Uh, can we share home working policies? I have to say, I believe both, both are starting at the wrong end. The answer to the question, uh, how many days a week or how much time will someone spend in an office needs to flow out of actually a set of principles. And what I've shared are 
the principles that we've developed as a starting point uh, at, at Aston. But very much what I would encourage people to do is think about, well, why are we actually having this debate? And I would argue the debate is actually about productivity, efficiency and effectiveness of the future uh, type of organisation. We've set out five principles for um, what we will do going into the future. Absolutely, as a starting point, whatever we do in the future has to be customer centric or in university terms, student centric, focused around the needs of the people who actually use the services that we provide. We've established a principle which I think is absolutely fundamental. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, which is actually whatever we do must demonstrate trust and respect for our staff as a starting point as a culture. What we want to do is trust our people to make the right decisions about where they work, when they work and how they work. Those work arrangements must foster a culture of collegiality. The purpose of a university, the type of organisations we are, requires collaboration, cooperation and in moving to new ways of work, we must, must not lose that essence. Um, however, we also need to recognise that that this is an opportunity to help individuals manage the boundaries between work and home much, much more effectively. Of all the staff surveys that we've been running, actually what our people have been telling us is there are a lot of positives out of the last 12 months that they don't want to lose in returning to whatever a new normal looks like. Uh, the flexibility created, the lack of um, having to having to get into a car or get onto public transport every day of the week where a work day is bounded by nine to five uh, and travel into a place of work has been a real has been a real benefit and they don't want to lose that in its entirety and our work arrangements will differ so while we're establishing a set of principles how they're actually implemented for different areas will, will vary um, across different uh, ac across different areas. So in terms of the context and the challenge, we're seeing this is efficiency, effectiveness and execution. This is about trying to create a dynamic working arrangements that support the needs of both our service users and also the staff who work at, at the university. However, dynamic working, hybrid working, the work arrangements isn't just about the people policies that we establish. Yes, people policy is, is a real key and we need to think about that. We need to provide people policies that provide choice, that, that empower our people, that are consistent with working practices. But it is also fundamentally in thinking about this, the coming together of, of three other domains. The first of those is space. Thinking about actually how do we use the space that we have, the estate that we have uh, at, at universities. And over time, we will need to create spaces that fit within those new agile and dynamic ways of working. And secondly is digital. Digital is the key that unlocks different ways of working. One of the things that we did very early on uh, in lockdown is we started the process of shipping out nearly a thousand laptops to staff so that everyone has a consistent set of technology that enables them during this period of time to work remotely, but will enable people to work in a dynamic way going forward. Have laptop will travel is is the new reality. Having a desk will not be part of that new reality. Having a place to nest will not be part of that new new reality. But having technology that enables collaboration, that enables connection, that enables agility will be part of that. And this has to be all underpinned by effective leadership and effective management, not just leadership for a new way of working, but leadership in terms of helping people to understand what those new arrangements will be, support people in deep, different ways. And this will be absolutely a challenge for managers, for staff. It's challenged us over the last 12 months. It will continue to challenge us um, into the future. I firmly believe that the style of management and the capabilities that we will require of managers will shift. It will shift to much more of a what, what I call a multimodal leadership that you will need to lead both remote individuals and individuals in face to face, and that will require different, uh, a different skill set. I'm just going to briefly focus on two areas, I suppose. So what we've done is taken our entire workforce and, and say, well, 
actually broadly they fit, fit into three categories. There's a category of on-site worker, so a campus worker. Some people are in the nature of their roles means that they won't be able to work remotely. Actually, their role requires them to be on campus. The vast majority, however, of our staff beyond those, that group will be hybrid workers and they will spend different amounts of time on campus and they will blend working remotely with working on campus. And it's thinking about actually when are you best placed to work on campus? What's the type of work that you need to do that is best done in person? And I think we're breaking this down and, and viewing this through the lenses of actually there's time to collaborate and time to cooperate and often that's best done on campus. There's a time for focus work and to manage energy and often that can be best achieved remotely in quiet spaces. The synchronous work and then asynchronous work. When you engage in asynchronous work, actually you don't need to be in a defined physical location. You can be in a remote location where it requires high levels of comp um, synchronous cooperation, then that be is best done in person. And that will differ from role to role and service to service. And then we'll have a few people who are permanently off site, who will permanently work uh, in a remote way. Just focusing on our on 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 the space um, aspect, one of the things that we have done is is actually start to create an agile workspace. And this is in the first instance aimed at a group of professional and support service staff. Broadly, what I'm showing up there is is a floor plate, and that floor plate was laid out in classic six offices. 95 desks, everyone owning a desk, the HR team being locked away from the finance team being locked away from the estates team being locked away from the IT section being locked away from the health and safety section. What we've done is open up that entire floor plate and what we have are different working spaces. The idea being that actually you go to the space that best suits the style of work that you're doing uh, at any one time. And in terms of moving towards that future, we definitely see the complete remodeling of the estate to fit with that dynamic working. So I think I've done my 12 minutes now. That's a real taster. I could talk forever uh, about what this will mean, the implications, the pros and cons, and actually what our journey is. But it, to say, you know, classically, we are at the outset, we're not gonna get every, everything right, but we are not gonna miss the opportunity as we come out of the current restrictions, we're not going to miss the opportunity not to reset fundamentally the way that we work. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, we've had a question come in from Rory, um, who has asked, how do we get over the line management barrier of trust and presenteeism where they do not trust the employee? So I think that goes back to our, our principles. Um, we fundamentally, we've discussed this with the with the executive, and, and fundamentally, one of our one of our principles is we are going to trust people. We are going to trust people to make the right choices, uh, and we're sending out really clear message to all their levels of management that actually that should be the starting point. People will need to be supported to make the right decisions, but we are firmly moving away. Um, we're firmly moving away from um, a management by line of sight, but I think in terms of maturing the culture of, of managing and enabling our managers to manage in that way, we need to rethink completely the way, for instance, in which we manage. We need to move away from a, a, a management by I can see you, therefore I can trust that I know what you're doing, to being much more focused on outputs and outcomes. Actually, I don't need to see you as long as we're both clear about what the outputs are that's required and what the outcomes are that are required. That that has to be the starting point. It will be a challenge and it will be a challenge for some managers, but we're really clear that that actually that is a shift. And we're starting to put into place the support for managers to grow that way of managing. Brilliant, thank you. Um, one more question. Um, how do people book their most appropriate space? So so just on, I've, I think I've hopefully still got up the slide which shows that floor plate. There were 95 desks there. What we know from that is that at any one time, on average, only 50% of those desks were actually occupied. That floor space will now seat 230 people. 
we think however that that 200 there's 230 spaces on that floor plate that can cater for 400 staff so a space which previously was for 95 staff is now for 400 uh, staff we don't envisage people will book spaces this is not a hot desking uh, environment people will go in and find the space that they that they need to work in. What we're not imagining is that people will go in and sit down and stay in a single location or a single seat for all of the day. Um, in terms of getting used to using this workspace, people move around to to the workspace that is most is best required. So if you're collaborating, you'll go to a collaboration space. If it's quite focused work that you require, then you can use one of our what one of the booths, for instance, that we've got there. So there will be no, you know, it'll be a very dynamic and fluid workspace. And I think, you know, we're not seeing booking unless it's meeting rooms, for instance, we're not seeing booking as as the way of controlling that space. Brilliant. Thank you. I think you're right. The the future isn't what it used to be. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's really not. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the other things that we're trying to do in there. So one of the other challenges is, well, what about when I go back to the office and, and, and we have teams meetings? Actually, if half the team, half the team um, are physically in the building and half team are, are remote, that's not going to work. Uh, and so gradually people will come back into the office because that's the way to do meetings. Um, I would argue that actually technology solves solves that problem for us. Um, so what we've got is seven teams meeting rooms. Um, each of those rooms are equipped with 75 inch uh, screens which have an embedded camera and the camera follows the room around to whoever is speaking. So you can genuinely have people who are remote dialing in via Teams and people physically in a location using a Teams meeting chat without it being stilted or feeling like actually you've got two different types of experience going on here. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Richard. And we've had a question come in just to ask whether the slides will be available after the seminar and they will be. We'll have copies so we can send them out to everyone because I know especially your um, presentation will be very, very helpful for, for the universities to implement. So thank you very much. Thanks, Brani. Brilliant. Right now, um, I've just got to do some techie bits to share various screens, <laughs> um, but we'll be hearing from Sheila Gupta, um, who is the Vice Principal for People, Culture and Inclusion at Queen Mary University of London. So over to you, Sheila. Thank you very much indeed for um, inviting me to participate in this discussion today. I'm very grateful to you. Um, and I thought I'd just say a little bit about myself before I go into my presentation. So um, I joined Queen Mary University in January 2020, so shortly before the real impact of the pandemic. Um, and of course, it was a very significant year in terms of Black Lives Matter. So the, um, the work and the initiatives that I'll be talking about uh, really cover the, pre the, the, the sort of the last year. Um, and just to give you a flavour of, uh, of the journey that we've come through. Um, so, um, Brian, may I have the first slide, please? So I've been invited to come and talk about the institutional strategy that I developed having joined Queen Mary um, in response to Black Lives Matter. Um, and I think the first thing that I really want to um, convey is that the university had already published its 2030 strategy and diversity and inclusion are at the very heart of that strategy. So um, what I'm going to talk about isn't in response to Black Lives Matter, but I think the, the, the reason it was particularly significant as a global event is because it really made us uh, visit our, our ambitions in relation to promoting race equality. And what it has done is it's really enabled us, if you like, to um, put together, I, I think, what is quite a bold and ambitious strategy for change. And it's one that we are challenging ourselves on, if you like, and it's given a real momentum to that work. So I think it has been a very important, it's been a very important event in that regard. And I think it's had that effect in many universities and many other organisations as well. Next uh, slide, please. Thanks, Bryony. Um, so this is our vision and mission as they appear in our strategy 2030. So our vision is to open the doors of opportunity um, and you can see from our mission, which I won't read out to you, but diversity and inclusion are at the very heart of that mission. Uh, and our overarching ambition is to become the most inclusive university of its kind anywhere by 2030. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, in my role as vice principal, um, I've developed a people, culture and inclusion enabling plan, which is essentially our overarching EDI strategy. And it's very much the culmination of consulting with staff and students across the university. It's not something that I've written independently. So it's very much the voice of our community. Um, and the plan actually comprises the actions and initiatives that we want to uh, follow through uh, in order to achieve and realise our vision and mission. So the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Steering Group is the most senior EDI committee of the university uh, and it's the responsibility of that steering group to deliver and implement the PCI enabling plan and I chair that group. One of the things I did do in response to Black Lives Matter is that that EDI group already existed before I joined the university, but it wasn't very diverse. So I expanded its membership in relation to staff and students. So it was far more representative of our university community. Um, and I think that, that was an important um, that was an important step to take. We have a range of equality groups that report into uh, the EDI steering group. Um, and in August 2020, I created the Race Equality Action Group. This is a group comprising staff from all levels of the university and students, both from the student sabbatical offices um, as well as students across the university. So it is very much intended to be a, a group that represents the views of our staff and our students. Together, in, since, since its inception, we've created a race equality action plan and strategy. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the initiatives that we're taking forward through that in a minute. Um, and we've also established a black and people of color network. Um, and the chair of that network also is a member of the Race Equality Action Group. And the reason that's important is that it provides a two-way channel of communication. So the views and voices of the people in our, in our network can actually help to shape and inform our strategies and actions. Next slide, please. Um, so there you will see the Race Equality Strategy and Action Plan. And these are our five objectives. Again, I'm not going to read them out, but I just want to say that what we have is we have set up a working group to lead on every single one of those objectives. Um, and those working groups are leading on a range of work streams. So there's quite a lot of work going on at ground level, if you like, to support those various objectives. And I'll just give a couple of examples, if I may, very, very quickly, which I'll expand on in a minute. Um, but one, in, in terms of celebrating and valuing a diverse community, one of the first things that our community sort of said to me, our staff and our students, was they didn't like the term BAME. Um, so we are actually working on trying to find language that resonates with our community. Um, and that work is in train at the moment. Um, we, we're also doing a lot of work to publish um, race equality data and be much more transparent about it. So we produce our ethnic pay gap data and we put that on the web. Um, and we also look at the success rates of people of colour um, in, ter in, in terms of our promotion processes. We are also taking on a number of actions to address harassment and bullying, which are born out of, for example, um, discrimination or hate crime um, and, and harassment and bullying generally. Um, and we have a range of, of, of training uh, that I'm talk about shortly um, and we're also working very closely with the student union uh, in terms of addressing the student awarding gap and in evolving and designing an inclusive curriculum. Next slide please. So I think one of the first things that I, I perhaps realised when I joined Queen Mary was it was so important to do as much as we possibly could to try and build a culture of trust and openness and transparency. Um, and really a comment that was made to me by many, many people is the importance of data. So what we're doing is we're embracing the principle of using evidence based decision making founded upon data um, so that we can see where we are and the distance travelled. So uh, so the EDI steering group have established these institutional KPIs um, where we're saying we're going to achieve 40 percent, give or take 5 percent of BAME representation at middle and senior levels of the university because we really need to better represent our community um, and 50 percent in relation to women at uh, middle and senior levels. Um, we're also embedding EDI into our decision making processes so any decision we take at the university will be equality, equality impact assessed. Uh, and again, that's really to foster a culture where we play, place EDI at the centre of our decision making. And that's irrespective of whether we're designing um, our office space, um, whether we're looking at um, our, our student residences or whether we're just looking at our people strategies. Um, again, we are really wanting to ensure that we challenge, we challenge ourselves by, put, by 
building trust into everything we do um, and measuring how much uh, we've improved by and indeed where we haven't to inform strategies we need to take to address that. So the ethnic pay gap report is a really good illustration of that. So that is now published uh, on our website and we've adopted an intersectional approach um, so that we're looking at, it, at uh, the pay gap reporting from both perspective of gender and BAME staff. We've also put together detailed data packs, which we're sending to faculty, schools and directorates, which have got reports, dashboards, data sets. And again, that's so that they can use this information to inform local level decision making. Um, and some of the things that we've looked at are, for example, um, the success of um, BAME staff in relation to academic promotions and that their success rates, the career progression of professional services staff, the ethnic pay gap data and student progression data. Um, and we're putting all of our staff and student data, um, we're publishing it on the website in the interest of promoting openness and transparency. Uh, next slide, please. So inclusive leadership and succession planning is at the very heart of creating the values based culture that we espouse in our 2030 strategy. And what we're saying is that the traits that make up an inclusive leader are absolutely essential if we're actually going to ensure that we optimise the talents of our diverse talent pool. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all the um, all the traits there. You can see them yourself. But what we have done is taken those and put them into a much more comprehensive leadership development framework, which one, finds the behaviours that we want to um, see from our leaders and two will inform all the leadership and management development training that we do and what that will do we hope is provide a very clear succession planning route so that we can improve diversity at every single level of leadership so going back to our KPIs it's very much about holding ourselves um, to account to say these are the actions we're taking and this is how we hope it will make a difference uh, and we do hope it will be by having far greater diversity through our, our leadership and management structures. Next slide please. Um, so in order to make sure that we have got um, a, a strong pipeline of diverse talent, um, work that we've undertaken uh, in the last few months, we've done a fundamental review of our academic promotions process and we've designed new academic career pathways. And in terms of embedding our values, we've embedded citizenship and inclusion as clear criteria that have to be met if you're going to be promoted. Um, and we think that that's really important. Um, we've also designed new competency frameworks for our professional services and technical staff. And the ambition there is so that staff have a sense of agency in planning their own career trajectory um, and deciding how they want to um, plan their careers moving forward. It can be linear, it can be sideways, it can be moving around the university, uh, but it's very much that it's a self-development model. Um, and then we've got a variety of other schemes there, as you'll see, the Be Mentor scheme, which is a scheme that we're in partnership with, with other London universities. We're about to introduce reverse mentoring and reciprocal mentoring. Um, and uh, one thing I've been delighted by is the number of external funding bodies um, are actually asking, asking universities to put in bids to really improve the, the pipeline of um, BAME students going from undergraduate to postgraduate through to becoming academic members of staff and pursuing academic careers um, and we've been applying for those bids uh, so I think that that's a really positive um, positive demonstration of commitment to this agenda from funding bodies as well. Next slide please. So I talked earlier about different strategies for addressing um, harassment and bullying, but also these, these are also strategies for addressing and embedding a culture of inclusion. So um, a few examples there of the training and development we've introduced. We haven't done all of this yet. This is for the whole year, uh, but we have so far introduced um, an, an online inclusion programme, which is mandatory for all staff, and that covers unconscious bias. Um, we've introduced mandatory training for anyone involved in recruitment selection, including refresher training for people who've already done it. Um, and anyone in a decision making role, whether they're dealing with recruitment, promotion or salary reviews, must must uh, participate in, in workshops on race equality issues. Um, and future training will cover dealing with issues like microaggressions, talking about conf talking confidently about race, understanding what privilege means and active bystander training. Next slide, please. Um, and I just wanted to finish by saying 
we've got a huge amount of work taking place in the student experience space. I've just picked three examples here, um, but there's, there's a lot more happening. But I talked earlier about the fact that we want to address the awarding gap. So two of the major initiatives we're taking forward is we're really enhancing the role of the academic advisor so that students can experience a holistic approach to how we provide support and development for them. Um, and we've created student staff liaison committees. Um, and these are partnership committees of students and staff working together at school level um, to pro provide a channel of student feedback to really inform and enhance the student experience that they can look forward to. Um, and we're also conducting conducting an audit of all our academic programmes um, so that we're using student interns so that they can see themselves in our curriculum. Um, and that's just to give you a flavour of some of the work taking place um, and to say thank you very much. That's my presentation concluded. Thank you very much, Sheila. I know it's a, um, a very, very poignant topic. I know it's the centre of a lot of conversations that I've been having recently, um, so I know it will be invaluable. Um, just to remind attendees that you can submit um, your questions or comments throughout in the um, question and answer chat. Um, a question that's come through, um, do you have a confidential reporting process um, and how do you deliver this? Um, for example, sharing the experience of bullying and harassment experience as a black employee, etc. Uh, yes, we have report and support, which I think is um, an anonymous, well, it's, it's a report and support process, which I think a number of universities have. Um, people can report anonymously to it. Um, and what we have done is um, we so we also have dis uh, we have um, dignity disclosure officers so people can actually talk to somebody as well. Um, but what we have done is we said through the report and support process, we report by bi biannually to the EDIS EDISG steering group um, anonymously, obviously. So we understand exactly what issues are coming up. We also identify the actions that will be taken to address those issues. So again, we can see what actions we've taken and whether they've made an improvement or not. Um, and again, that is that is shared publicly, anonymously. Um, but again, we want to be open and transparent to say these are the issues that we're still experiencing at this university. These are the strategies we've taken. Um, and now we want to see if they're actually making and contributing to improving the, the, the situation. I think we have to understand that it's a journey. And we may not get things right the first time round, um, but I, I go back to this point about we do have to be open and honest when not everyone in our community is behaving as we'd like them to do and, and upholding our values. It's a very difficult, difficult situation, It's but we're very, I mean, we're all human. We're all um, trying to handle it the best way that we can, aren't we? We are. Super. Thank you very much, Sheila. That's brilliant. And I know your presentation will be invaluable to um, many, many universities and recruiters. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Brilliant. So last but definitely not least, um, we have our sp final speaker of the day, um, which will be Ian Hodson, who is the head of reward at University of Lincoln. And Ian will be discussing employee engagement. Again, a very um, poignant subject for this year in particular. So over to you, Ian. Thank you, Bryony, and uh, thank you for the invite to come along and speak. And it seems only apt following Richard and Sheila and having conversations about space and then inclusion that we now move on to looking at reward benefits and engagement. So uh, there is a comprehensive set of slides that will be available from Bryony after this, but I thought in 10 to 12 minutes, I'll just start some dialogue and discussion. And uh, if you want to request the slides afterwards, then by all means do so. Uh, if you want to post anything in the chat as we go along, we'll pick it up uh, as a debate at the end. So just talking about rewards and benefits and uh, an opportunity just to pass my musings really in terms of the future of where that's going. Uh, I'm very much thinking about what that impact of COVID has been on how we design reward packages, thinking about the agile workforce that, that Richard's alluded to, how maybe employee well-being has changed its perspective into being part of what we expect uh, a reward package to be and, and how that will engage us, thinking about what might work in a more virtual workplace that we might end up in, and of course the old dialogue of, of communication uh, and how do we make sure that we can effectively communicate if we are potentially going to work in different ways. So I'll also interject that with just some examples of what we found at Lincoln and where we've been experimenting with different engagement tools throughout the last year. Uh, and we're very much at that decision stage of working out what needs to stay 
post COVID uh, when we're more in control of, of our actions and it is our decision of what we do and, and what maybe we need to reinvent differently. I think that's probably an important part to start at. In, in my opinion, in terms of COVID, we are certainly probably having been through the stage of resolve and resilience uh, and getting through the last 12 months, we are still only perhaps looking at the return stage. So by no means is uh, everything concluded and we're clear about what's going on. I still see this very much as an experimentation stage for us before we then move on to what will be the exciting part of what reimagination and reform looks like and how we do make sure that we're engaging the workforce. And I think that's the part that we have to remember we are chasing here. Ultimately, we're trying to look at how do we motivate staff because of the belief that if people are motivated, they'll be engaged. If people are engaged, they'll be productive. And I think we're not only now looking at what will motivate people in terms of what we can offer them as an employer, but we're also trying to combat for what could demotivate people in the workplace. And that's something that's important to, uh, for us to keep thinking about. So we've started that dialogue in terms of thinking about what does a reward package need to look like? Because uh, as Richard suggests, we do believe that working in a more agile way will become more of the norm for a remote worker. How broken have our traditional communication channels been over the last 12 months? And what has that highlighted that we need to look at? And what alternatives might there be to some of those workplace perks that we've traditionally relied on and that dependency on that traditional model of uh, aspects of pay and pensions and annual leave and what people may be looking for now as working life and home life becomes a much more blended experience. We know that the initial impact of COVID meant that we had to look at some of those remuneration strategies that we'd been dependent on and certainly having to move away from being dependent upon them. Many of us will have experienced you know, significant impacts on cash flow in the last 12 months. Some of us will have experienced the sector pay freeze uh, and the voluntary pay freezing of things like bonuses or other aspects of promotion activities that people perhaps see as uh, one of the engagement tools of progression and pay. Um, incremental progressions have maybe been highlighted for debate as well as scaling down some of the aspects that have financial links in terms of recognition activities. I think all of those activities have meant that the last 12 months summarises as we have to be a lot less dependent on some of our remuneration activities to create engagement and that means we're going to have to be a little bit more creative with what we can offer in the workplace. So thinking about that more agile workforce, I think some of our initial considerations around the reward agenda and assessing their needs is that actually what is the aspect of how much does home working become a benefit in itself that we need to promote and offer in terms of that flexibility. At our university in Lincoln we had started the piece of work back in 2019 looking at how we could become a more agile employer where the aim was to be able to give back people flexibility in terms of not only where they work but also when they work in terms of giving them back important timings of the day. Admittedly, we never expected to go live with the whole workforce working in that way. The original intentions remain in place that we need to learn from being having that opportunity of having a, a, a pilot a scheme from it. So thinking about that reward and the agile workforce, you know, we have to think about the fact that we, we come off the back of COVID with some real extremities in terms of things like financial scenarios that people find themselves in and how that might spill over into what's happening in the workforce. I think mental health has uh, now got a very different role in terms of moving into something that is far less reactive but is more an expectation of being a much more proactive and as, as Sheila touched on as part of that inclusion agenda we need to make it much more okay that it forms part of our leadership and development programs and what people expect to see as part of our employee offering that we talk about mental health and we educate around it. And um, thinking about what Richard touched on and mentioned is much more so for the agile workforce, managing by uh, output and not by presenteeism, which does give that ability to give time back to individuals, the important time of the day to them. Um, recruitment has become a big aspect of how do you make those first impressions as part of recruitment if we're not gonna be bringing people 
to the campus and how do you embed that culture? And also the importance of surveys and, and both Sheila and Richard touched on making sure you listen to the workforce and what they're saying. So surveying the workforce becomes very, very important. And touching on that, um, I just wanted to give some initial outcomes that we found from our surveys, which very much outline the importance of working in different ways and the benefits that it will give, but also making sure that we don't fall into a new set of pitfalls. So these statistics are available in the presentation after the event, but I'll just highlight some of them. But 83% uh, of our respondents, when we surveyed those working from home, agreed or strongly agreed that implementing this type of agile working permanently would give them a better work-life balance. 76% of re respondents agreed or strongly agreed that implementing a more agile way of working would permanently make them happier. 36% of respondents felt more positively about their job as a result of the home working environment. 53% of respondents said that more agile working has helped them significantly with their caring responsibilities. And 42 respondents said that working in a more agile environment has, has um, helped them feel that they're developing further. So lots of positives if we can embed these different changes in terms of the ways of working. However, the pitfalls are there as well to make sure that we've got to put other things in place. So the main challenges of working from home were identified unsurprisingly as that interaction and trying to produce barriers between work and life as it all blends into not only uh, one area in terms of where you're working, if you are working from home, but also the crossovers between the timings. 31% of respondents said that they would need additional training and development to maximise their productivity if working away from the regular workspace. 85% of respondents uh, agreed, uh, sorry, strongly disagreed or disagreed that flexible working is too hard to implement. So a lesson for us, I think it is now much more of an expectation that we can offer flexibility than what it was prior to COVID. Um, but 60% of individuals answered that they often uh, felt that their workload has increased and 40% of respondents saying they felt stressed. One of the ones that's really significant for me is the fact that 27% of the workforce said that they actually felt disconnected from the wider university which is, is quite a significant number, particularly as a university where we've been very reliant on that vibrant workplace environment to motivate people, which what we, we outlined is our original intention with rewards and benefits approaches is to make sure that workforce is motivated. So some interesting survey results there. We're due to go out and survey our workforce again in the next couple of weeks. We'll see what's moved, but lots of positives to be gained in terms of embedding some of these changes more permanently, but some other constraints that we need to make sure we've got actions in place for. So in terms of what we've been working on at Lincoln in very much this experimentation phase, I just thought I'd highlight a few activities that have, have gone well that we'll be considering for, you know, does this now become a, a, a something that we'll embed into our normal practices? So we've reviewed our EAP services and we've taken the opportunity that EAP has become something which is much more about supporting general lifestyle and uh, supporting that inclusion uh, agenda rather than what it has perhaps been viewed as, um, as something that is very reactive when people actually need help rather than something that's trying to educate and facilitate and signpost prior to that. So I think there's going to be a big change in terms of how we perceive EAPs as perhaps filling some of those gaps that colleagues talking in the workplace gave us if we're going to work in in different ways. We've certainly increased our mental health first aid provision and as those surveys suggest there are some stresses attached to not being around colleagues uh, and people working in different ways. So we have very much embedded an approach with our mental health first aid of having area champions but equally having that central pool of individuals and trying to make them much more accessible uh, and attainable to the workforce. Uh, our, our recognition events have become much more virtual. So we hosted our annual recognition awards for individual merit, team achievement awards and behavioural um, activities in a virtual way. That will probably much be, be much more the norm now in terms of how we host events 
around uh, recognition activities. We've turned all of our uh, campus facilities that we've always been fortunate to have in terms of offering staff, clubs and societies, whether that be uh, sporting sessions uh, and groups. Without that ability, we've turned them into much more of a virtual offering. So we've had some real success uh, in not only the physical activity, but also the mental health activity of running things like virtual walking clubs, virtual running clubs that are giving the people the opportunity to come together, do the activity, but also feel connected into their colleague. So at the minute, our virtual running club are, are completing a, a challenge trying to get from uh, Russia to Cape Town and complete the distance before Christmas. They completed the distance uh, of heading from Lincoln to Lapland. But it's very good to see that colleagues really embrace that sense of having a shared goal and outside of the group are posting their distances and getting their family members involved. And it becomes much more of a, of a community approach than this is what we do with work colleagues. Um, colleague check-ins have become much more important. So we introduced a suite of e-postcards to support our traditional e-recognition cards to make sure that it was OK just to give colleagues a, you know, a drop in uh, and to give that introduction. We know that one of the biggest uh, aspects people have found is that often, you know, the, the periods between work can be very, very lonely if you're in an empty house uh, working in a remote way and, and giving colleagues permission just to drop in and have that chat that we'd normally have between pieces of work has become important. So our job is to make sure we've got facilitation in place for doing that. Uh, we've seen some old favourites in terms of what we offer as part of benefits return. Things like staff suggestion schemes become really important so that staff feel involved in contributing towards what some of these changes might be in the reform and things like cash plans and health schemes have become popular again. Um, thinking about new employees, how do we onboard staff and staff inductions and what do they look like? Uh, and making sure that, you know, for those financial extremities that we see at the moment, uh, that we've got different savings vehicles in places for people that will support them with different things. So, you know, workplace ISAs uh, are a great opportunity. We have a payroll savings scheme for people to save direct from payroll, uh, which just give people the different opportunities to, to be money savvy and, and wise in terms of what we offer and support as an employee. And those social connections have been important as well. And how do you facilitate social connections working in more agile ways? We've launched uh, activities such as a virtual book club that gives staff the opportunity to post and leave reviews. Uh, we've got joint uh, playlists going on around things like the running club. But this, this idea that we all contribute, um, albeit virtual, to creating activities together. Uh, the virtual book club also allows staff the opportunity to, uh, to leave reviews of books uh, that they're reading for their, for their children. And we have every month we uh, load out 10 books for, for our staff and for their children where they can ask to, to have a book to review. Uh, leave their reviews for their colleagues. And this idea of community and how you can create that virtually uh, is important. So I just want to touch on a couple of things that we've done as well that have worked. We launched something called Home Hub as a response to COVID. Uh, that's gone down very well. That's our virtual site that we wanted to feel like a magazine, which was about allowing individuals to take ownership of their own well-being. And our job again was to facilitate that. So it has a magazine feel with uh, different sections there in terms of eat well, exercise well, finance well, learn well, well mind and work well, which has in there articles from some of our academics, some tools that individuals can use for that self-assessment and prompt signpost into other activities that are going on. And then equally some capture from other colleagues in terms of their feedback on, on different activities uh, to again, make sure that everybody feels like they're being drawn together. So. Home Hub is something that has worked incredibly well for the last 12 months that will feature in part of our plans to say, well, is that something then that we need to evolve and build on and continue? And it's all about sharing those colleague stories. We also launched a financial well-being site called Life Choice, which moved what was our traditional financial education and well-being program, which is very much classroom based into being an online platform of videos, tools, etc. Again, we'll be reaching the point of saying in reimagination and reform, does that form part of a normal offering? Communication, I just want to touch on. So 
So without the, the uh, having face to face communication as much, we know communication is challenging at a university because there's so much of it. And we are very good at not always uh, sticking to doing things the same way and challenge and try to do it differently. One thing we do know is though that emails cannot be the only source of communication. We certainly see email fatigue coming in now where the email is getting used for everything, which isn't just work, but it is also trying to be the social tool. Uh, uh, a link and what we've experimented with is certainly having our HR line newsletter that goes out every two weeks, which covers everything from the strategic messages to the HR messages to the social and the wellbeing messages. And then we also use Twitter, which is about getting out spontaneous tips and, and important information that needs to go out quicker. And then Instagram, which we use for telling colleagues stories. But we do know communication and it's going to be a challenge and we need to think about um, how we're going to use it. And finally, one of our big aspects of that communication has been how we host our benefits in the presentation. If you request it, you'll see our link on platform, which is about having a specific communication tool for all of our uh, reward offering, our recognition offering, our well-being offering and our employee benefit offering. So uh, link on has become something that sits on everybody's desktop that makes sure that people are clearly signposted to the communication tool that pulls that all together rather than what we often see, which is our offering is very spread out on our platform. So reimagination and reform is a stage that we're looking forward to. You know, we need to establish what the new norms are going to be. There is a difference between home working and agile working, and we need to be careful we don't fall in the trap uh, of assuming that home working will address the needs. Uh, thinking about leadership and management first uh, and the difference in terms of the style that we need and how they need to be champions. We do need to invest in our well-being plans because that will form much more part of an employee benefits package than a reactive offering and what that looks like. Uh, we need to make sure that we're giving that individualistic approach to employees. That seems to come across now. Um, and we need to make sure that we're creating the workplace culture that we are so used to of being in a university campus virtually. And the question still remains about how can we do that best? And then most importantly, ensuring that it's all flexible. Um, I think one aspect that we haven't seen yet uh, come to fruition, but the loss of both personal development and professional development through not all being in the same workplace will really leave us with something uh, to fill as a gap in terms of well, how can we ensure that we are all still developing and learning if we're not all going to be together in the same workspace. So lots of things there just to, uh, to trial, Brian, in terms of reimagination and reform of what constitutes what we offer our employees to ultimately keep them motivated and engaged. Brilliant, thank you. There's so much information there and I know you've only really just managed to scratch the surface. There's so, so much to cover, but I think the initiatives are, uh, they're, they're brilliant. Obviously, you know, we're all, you know, obviously you're in a position to implement these, but you're also an employee yourself. So to have those systems in place and those things available um it's just invaluable it's it's almost more important than the monetary obviously we've all got bills to pay but <laughs> the community side is so so important and i know myself i mentioned the other day i've gone from knowing what my colleagues are having for dinner to not knowing what they're doing for weeks at a time so just having that community um pool is is so so important I think so, Bryony, and um, part of Future Briefing, uh, what we offer now is uh, there's a wonderful report which is called Graduate Insights, which is from our own graduates about what they expect from their employers. And what we know is that the trend of attracting uh, our own graduates into the workplace is very much that there's an expectation of development being offered that is more important than pay. The fact that I feel that I'm being developed for the workplace culture and who I'm working with and are they happy? And I want to see the people that I'm going to be working with. So I know that you know it matters a lot more. Um, there is going to be much more of a blended approach, uh, which would have happened anyway, but COVID's perhaps been an accelerator of how work and outside work life interact. And that's what we're really trying to control. And I think there will be spillover between the two. And as an employer, we've got to take much more responsibility in making sure that people are you know, happy in general, and that's quite a big responsibility for us to undertake, but one that we have to. Absolutely, brilliant. Um, one question has come through um, asking, would you be willing to share a copy of your home hub? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some snapshots on the slides. If somebody wants to pick up individually with me, uh, just email me ihodson at lincoln.ac.uk. Quite happy to. Um, I think it is the way forward for well-being and the concept of, you know, facilitate and give people the tools to own their well-being and then find ways with virtual activities to bring them together. But we've got to allow people to access uh, well-being when they want to. Uh, and, and often, um, you know, that isn't going to be at times when we can just put on a session and have everybody attend it at the same time. Much more flexibility uh, around when and how we work, I think. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm just checking to see whether any more questions or um, comments have come through. Um, I know that all this information is so, so valuable and it's a bit like, you know, well, it's a bit like the government. We're all going through it together. We, nobody has the answers, but I think everyone does tend to turn to HR in particular, thinking that you you have all the magic remedies and it is a very difficult um, position and a, and a big responsibility to obviously put all these things in place. So, no, thank you very much for sharing all your all your experiences and what you've done at Lincoln. Brilliant. So, oh, someone's just asked, could you please repeat your email address? Yes, so it's uh, I Hodson, the I H O D S O N at Lincoln dot A C dot U K. Sounded like a uh, a TV competition there for a moment, Bryony. <laughs> if anybody telephones me, we won't charge premium rates or anything like that. I was going to say I'll run through the T's and C's later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. We'll obviously, you know, we'll we'll send all the slides through. Um, and I know, you know, if anyone's had to shoot off for uh, meetings or lunch or anything else that's that's come up, then um, we'll we'll share all the information. But I, I found it very useful and 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 helpful. And and I look forward to um speaking with you soon. So um, thank you to everyone for attending and our three fantastic speakers. I hope um, everyone enjoyed the opportunity to share um, some knowledge from within the sector um, and found the topics beneficial. So just a quick reminder that we are hosting two further webinars um, on Thursday the 11th and Thursday the 18th. Um, Thursday the 11th will focus on rebuilding the workforce and then Thursday the 18th will be the HR managers open forum. So we've got a couple of questions that have already been submitted. Um, you can submit questions ahead of time. We'd actually prefer you to, so we can obviously make sure that we've got answers lined up for you. Um, you can submit your questions in advance by emailing wegmarketing at warwick.ac.uk. Um, I believe that should appear on your screen now, but I'll just repeat it again. So it's wegmarketing, W-E-G, marketing at warwick.ac.uk. Um, so thank you again, and we hope you join us again next week. Take care.